Okay, let me start screen sharing. Can everyone see this okay? Awesome. Okay, so before we get started, I would like to share the land acknowledgement that we have here in place at MSP. And before the event um, takes place, I would like to do a 30 um, seconds of silence. Thank you. So if you don't know me, my name is Erin Long and I am the current graduate assistant here at Multicultural Services and Programs and I am over the LGBTQ Student Resource Center. And tonight's event is called Masculinity in the LGBTQ Plus Community, When Does It Become Toxic? It is um, February 23rd, 2021, that was my mistake, from 5 to 6 p.m. And tonight, I would like to introduce our guest speaker for tonight, William Edwards, the president of Spectrum. So one moment while I get him on here. There we go. Hi friends, it's good to see you all. Give me just a second here while we pull up our video and pull up our ourselves here. Um, let's see, all right. Thank you all for being here tonight. It's great to see a large group here. Um, <clears throat> all right, so I will go ahead and just jump right, right into this um, so that we can get started. Uh, gender and sexuality, a starting point. Gender precedes, sorry, gender precedes sexuality, and we code for these things constantly. <clears throat> so, uh, so obviously tonight we're going to be talking about um, gender and, uh, you know, uh, masculinity and obviously when those things become toxic, right? Um, and how they become toxic and what it means when those things are toxic um, and sort of how and why that happens. So <clears throat> the reason that I wanted to start here and the reason that I labeled this as a starting point is obviously because this is where I think we have to begin our talk about this. So what I mean when I say that gender precedes sexuality is that we have to know what gender is before we know what sexuality is. <clears throat> and what I mean by this is when we say that, um, you know, let's say that you're talking to a group of children and you say, you know, well, it doesn't even have to be children. But when we say the phrase, um, I'm a boy who likes boys, we have to have a shared sense of what a boy is and what we mean when we say like, right? So <clears throat> if I say that I'm a boy who likes boys, then that's assuming that we are in a framework where the people that I'm talking to know what I mean when I say boy and they know what I mean when I say like. So you can't have a shared, um, a shared uh, definition about sexuality without previously having a shared sense of gender because for most of humankind, we code sexuality against lines of gender, right? <clears throat> And when we code for these things, it, it does not only code for who we have sex with or how we have sex based on what gender is. <clears throat> it's also these gendered codes of how we behave, how we perceive the behavior of those around us. Um, so especially when people say, um, when people accuse those of us in the LGBTQ uh, um, uh, group 
of always talking about gender, always talking about sex. Why does all that stuff matter, right? Like, what is gender studies and, and why does it matter, right? Well, because we code for these things in our lives on a daily basis. <clears throat> and so to understand what it means to be a boy in the world or be a man in the world or anything else in the world, there are certain codes that we have, uh, you know, built into the way that we live that tell us things about gender, right? Um, <clears throat> and gender, as we know, or as you may not know, I suppose, is a socially constructed thing, right? Um, and it's sort of twofold because gender is at the same time, something that we know and feel about ourselves, but it is also something that has uh, social uh, currency outside of our own selves. And those are the kind of those are the kinds of things that we code for. Um, so we have to understand um, when we say things like "I am a man," that reads to the rest of the world in a certain way, um, and it doesn't always have to. It does not always have to involve sexuality, but but it certainly does. And the way that we code masculinity as a gender marker does have to do with sexuality, which is why I included both of them here and why I think that we have to have that as a starting point um, to even begin talking about this, right? <clears throat> Let's see. Why does this matter and what does this mean? So I sort of already touched on this. Um, these codes are important because we use them to structure our, our <clears throat> pardon me, ourselves in the world, right? So when you think about what masculinity is and why that's important and its implications for the LGBTQ plus group of people, um, especially in terms, of, in terms of it being toxic, um, one of the questions that I often get when I talk about this kind of stuff is why does it matter and what does that even mean? Well, as I said in the last slide, it matters because it has so much to do with our lives. <clears throat> if gender, I, I, I pose this question to people, if gender didn't matter, then when somebody said, when, when somebody proclaims their gender, it wouldn't be a big deal. Um, if somebody says, I'm a trans man, and we lived in a world where gender wasn't important in the way that it is, we might all be able to say, oh, okay, cool, and go about our day as like it's no big deal, right? But we don't do that. Um, I believe that we should. I believe people are safer when we do, right? Um, but as most of us know, we don't live in a world where that is possible unless you fall into very strict organizations of gender and sex. So it bodes well for us to talk about this stuff because it has so much to do with all these other categories in, in our lives. <clears throat> and that's always something else that I, that I like to start out with about why this is important because, you know, when I tell people that I'm a gender studies major, often they say, well, what the heck does that mean? And why is this important? And how do you even study something like that, right? Um, <clears throat> and the reason that it matters is because we use gender and sexuality and sex as a third category too, um, to code or to understand all kinds of things about who we are, the world that we're in and how we behave toward each other and even behave toward ourselves. So, um, it's important because it informs lots of other things that we do and things that we care about. Um, let's see. And as I just said, these codes give us a script about what it means to be anything in the world, right? <clears throat> so if we're talking about masculinity, um, I sort of didn't know where to begin with this topic because I identify as a man, uh, I'm cis, I'm, I'm white. Um, so right there, that sort of gives me a head start in these kinds of conversations. Um, language has a lot to do with this. Being gay has a lot to do with this. And the topography of our social scripts have a lot to do with this. So as a man, I can walk into a particular space and have privileges that other people do not. The fact that I'm a gay man subverts some of those privileges 
um, and others, it, being gay subverts, so, <clears throat> pardon me, subverts some of those things, but not all of those things, right? Um, and the reason that I included uh, the point about being gay in here is that oftentimes when we talk about masculinity and whether or not it is toxic, it is invariably connected to the way that we treat homosexual people or gay people, right? Um, and my, my driving point behind that and probably my focal point for tonight is that what we in a Western and cis-normative and heteronormative and even in a homonormative, even though that's sort of a double negative, um, what we mean when we say masculinity and what comes to mind when we say those things often has to do with, as I said, how we treat gay people. So when you approach masculinity from a Western framework, um, a lot of what masculinity is for people is dependent on also what masculinity is not, right? So when we think of stereotypes about being a man in the world, right, or at least in the Western sense of world, is, you know, somebody that's tough, usually uh, being coded as straight, right? Um, <clears throat> so our language affects a lot of this, right? When we say that something is gay and we mean it in a negative sense, right? Oh, that's so gay. That's something that a lot of straight men will say in order to modify their own their own sense of self and to modify the the um the uh fellowships that they have with with other men in their lives right um a more colloquial way of saying that is um when people say things like no homo right there's this idea that if we're going to behave in a certain way whatever that way is, right? If we're being more sensitive to something um, because, you know, men aren't supposed to be, you know, uh, sensitive to certain things, right? Then if we're being that way, then we have to code for the fact that we're not being gay when we do that, right? So <clears throat> that's the kind of stuff that I mean when I say that so much of our social Western construction of masculinity is built on and coded for the things that we are not, right? A lot of what being a man is within that stereotypical framework is the stuff that we aren't, right? We don't cry. We don't wear certain kinds of clothes. We only have sex in a certain way. We only speak in a certain way, right? And all those things that are opposite of those certain ways are usually the double-sided stereotypes for gay men, right? Um, which is, as I said, why I included um, the gay um, aspect on this particular slide. Um, it is not an accident that a lot of things that are stereotypically normal for gay men, if we were to like put those on a spreadsheet, they are things that are stereotypically expected of straight men. And that was another point about when we code for these things, why we code for them in a certain way and what that means. Um, so these fault lines, what I mean by that title is, um, you know, that these things are traceable, right? These things are knowable, traceable things in our world. Um, as I said, most of them are opposite in terms of uh, the topography of our social lives. It means that as a, it, that, that when we are talking about masculinity and the stereotypes that are inside that, um, as I said, we don't cry, we don't wear certain clothes, we act a certain way, all of those things. And it's not an accident that the opposites of those stereotypes are the stereotypes that are normal for gay men, which is, again, why you have to understand gender almost before you understand sexuality. Because, again, if we're going to say, well, I'm a boy that likes boys, if we say I'm a boy, everybody that you speak to, you could go out on the street right now and you could say, what's a boy and what's a girl to somebody walking on the street, right? And most people are going to have a very normative sense of what that is, because as a culture, we have shared, uh, shared, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of, shared uh, definitions for what those things are. And to deviate from them, 
mean something and to reinforce them without deviating from the mean something as well. Um, so as I said in the slide, these code and inform our, um, uh, basically everything in our lives. And I, I know that I've said that quite a few times, but I, I want people to understand how deeply the normalization of what the gender binary is, how, how deeply that goes. And it inverts itself. Like I said, uh, well, what I mean by that is, um, like I said about a lot of masculinity, a, a lot of what is stereotypically masculine for men, and therefore, if we ride that stereotype for straight men and for cis men, is behaving in a way that is opposite of acting homosexual, um, which is uh, which is part of why when when certain men do things that are coded socially as being gay, they have to say that it's not gay while they do it, right? Um, otherwise, it wouldn't matter that two men who are friends hug each other without it being gay, right? Or without people thinking that it's gay, right? Um, and we'll, we'll come back to that um, as we talk more, um, more about this whole thing. But when I was putting together what I was going to uh, talk about here, it occurred to me that when we think about stereotypes of masculinity, a lot of the stereotypes that we have for straight men or for men in general, straight being one of those stereotypes. Because um, when I say the word masculinity to you, you probably default to a straight-centric view of the world, right? Um, but the reason that I also added this particular slide in here is that gay men um, sort of do the same thing. Gay men also have, sometimes have, as we'll be talking about, toxic uh, definitions of what it means to be a man. And we see this in the way that certain aspects of the, of, uh, well, I, I don't even wanna say it like that. Um, the gay world, <laughs> as we will say, um, has quite the preoccupation with masculinity. Even when we are comfortable in our masculinity um, as gay men, we are sometimes attracted to things that are not the most, um, that when we, we are thinking about our um, attraction and the way that we hold ourselves in the world, sometimes we will still use the stereotypes that happen to be toxic about how a man should act in the world to still code our behavior, right? So we see this when two men are together and may maybe they're both gay, but one, is seen as, you know, who's who's the straight one in the pair, right? Um, even when we say things like who's the top and who's the bottom or who's the tough one, right? There are all kinds of ways that we code for how you act as a man, even when you're gay. <laughs> and that's how part of these, um, that's part of how this uh, toxicity bleeds into um, the lives of queer, queer folks and, um, and how that sort of happens, right? Let's see. So what is this toxicity and how does it function? And we are not allowed to be our whole selves. So <clears throat> all, all of that toxicity that we see has a specific uh, modality in our lives. So this toxicity that sometimes happens, it's not an accident um, and it has a specific function. It's meant to regulate the behavior of those that it is prescribed to. Um, and it's also part of like the larger power structure in the world, um, but I won't go into that too much because that's not really what we're here to talk about. But this toxicity has a very obvious function. When you go into the locker room at a junior high and a bunch of 13 year old boys are, you know, saying slurs and cursing and joking around, that is how masculinity gets coded to young boys. That's how the Western world a lot of times codes and acts about masculinity. And then they grow up and, you know, you get all kinds of toxic masculinity that you see from 40 year old men as opposed to 13 year old boys, right? Um, and so much of that is about making sure that the rest of the men in the room whether that's the locker room or not, or just the rest of the world, know that you're not gay, right? 
So w w what does that mean in regard to toxicity within the gay community, right? Because um, it sounds originally like it shouldn't match up, but it does, or that it shouldn't influence one or the other, right? If I'm saying that so much of uh, traditional masculinity is stereotyped, um, the, the stereotyped parts of that are the ways in which men at large uh, make sure that other men know that they're not gay. Well, then what does that mean for other gay men? Um, or for gay men in relation to other gay men instead of gay men in relation to straight men. Um, well, we kind of see this a lot um, with stereotypes within gay men or about gay men as well. Um, because even uh, there's, a, there's a very large portion of the LGBTQ plus uh, community um, that is, you know, uh, cis, that is white, that is still very privileged. And it is part of the way um, that power, even within the gay subgroup of the larger like masculinity um, globally, polices itself, right? Um, maybe, you know, my gay friends and I, maybe we're not straight, M maybe we're, we're both men or we're all men, but we're not straight, right? But we still have ways that we code for masculinity, right? Whether that's um, bottom shaming or being like the catty gay stereotype, right? Like if we're going to be men and we're going to be gay men, there's still a very specific and stereotyped way that we do that in the world, right? And then that allows us to not be our whole selves, right? So much of, of like being a, a man in the world, as I've said, is about what you are not or about what you are expected to do, right? Especially from a straight perspective. You're supposed to be uh, the provider. You're supposed to be like the dominant force, right? So what we see in terms of these, uh, of these uh, stereotypes and why they're not good for us is that those same, you know, 13 year old boys uh, in gym are, are told that they can't cry, are told that they can't love who they wanna love, are told that they have to look a certain way to count as a man in the world, right? And that means that you don't get to show up as your whole self, right? So when we're thinking about what makes something toxic and why, if it's toxic, then it is bad, is that you're not allowed to show up as your whole self to the table. And any framework in which you're not able to do that is probably one that benefits from your, uh, from your um, uh, mistreatment or your being not allowed into that particular group, right? Um, so we're not allowed to show up as our whole selves. And masculinity, again, codes for that. You have to act like a man. And that means that you can't cry. That means that you have to be in charge. That means that you can't feel your feelings. That means that you, you know, have to orient yourself in a very specific way 100% of the time. Otherwise, you lose your man card, right? Otherwise, you are called gay and the rest of your friend group laughs, right? Um, and when that happens, as I said, we don't get to show up as our whole selves, right? Um, and the quote at the bottom here is by a famous uh, gender, uh, sorry, a famous gender philosopher. Um, she says that uh, gender is a kind of imitation for which there is no original. In fact, it is a kind of imitation that precedes the very notion of the original as an effect and consequence. Um, and the reason that I added this in here, let me find it. Um, that heterosexuality is always in the act of elaborating itself. Um, what Butler means by that is the sort of the same thing as my point about a lot of masculinity, a lot of our stereotypes about how masculinity functions and what it is, is always in opposition to being gay, right? Because in our binary understanding of gender, the opposite of straight, is gay, right? And so all those stereotypes that we have for straight men, if you flip them, are the stereotypes that we have for gay men, right? Um, and 
her point here is that socially heterosexuality is always on the defense in the sense that it always has to um, elaborate itself to prove itself because when you strip those things back you realize that there's not actually anything there right somebody's sexuality could be in fact that they are straight but all those other notions about what that means are socially fabricated lies that we prescribe to people in order to function in power dynamics, right? Um, so that's why I added that in there. Um, and I just wanna drive home this point of, of not being able to be our whole selves because that's really what toxicity does. And when you add toxicity into a power structure, you could argue that a power structure being a power structure is inherently uh, you know, not good in the first place, but this toxicity functions specifically. It's not something that randomly happens because I'm a man and so it happens to me, right? This toxic, this, like, this, um, <clears throat> sorry, this functions with intention behind it. If it didn't, then it wouldn't matter that we tease our straight friends about being gay, right? Because that specific phrase wouldn't have functioning behind it. Um, straight men wouldn't spend a lot of time teasing their straight male friends about the way that they act or the way that they speak or the clothes that they wear, you know, um, if there wasn't social currency behind those things. And, and, you know, that still means that we don't get to show up as our whole selves. And just as sort of a blanket statement, anything that requires you to subtract parts of yourself that way, the way that toxicity does, you, you can't be a man if you act this way, or you're not uh, full in your capacity of your masculinity if you act a certain way, right? Um, then you don't get to show up to the table as your whole self. And as I said, as a blanket statement, I believe that you should be able to. And the philosophy of toxicity here works in direct opposition to that, right? Otherwise, grown men wouldn't have a, a problem saying that they're sad about something or crying in front of their spouses or, you know, being so uncomfortable about somebody being gay or, um, you know, people wearing whatever clothes they want to wear, right? And it also has a lot to do with uh, the way that the gay community treats uh treats uh, <clears throat> pardon me treats trans people um i was talking to somebody just yesterday about how there's a lot of transphobia in gay circles and they were surprised to hear that because it's like oh we're one big happy family right like how does that happen and it's like well <laughs> you know cis uh not always white but cis white uh, you know privileged gay men sometimes take that social uh, functionality of masculinity and use it to hurt gender non-conforming people, right? So that's sort of where we graduate into, you know, we sort of started with this straight versus gay framework, and now we're going into, you know, purely uh, LGBTQ plus stuff where uh, toxicity specifically in our own groups and it still means that you can't show up as your whole self, right? If you are a gay man in the world, there are just as many stereotypes for how you're supposed to be as there are for straight men. When you align those stereotypes between gay men and straight men, they don't mean the same thing. Um, but if you line them up with gay men and other gay men in the same community, right, then the fact that you don't like Lady Gaga or watch Drag Race or wear certain brands of clothes or God knows what, right, still has social currency against, well, oh, you know, you're not like us, right? Um, so it still means that you can't show up as your whole self to the table. Um, and it also sort of does what the quote here is talking about, where we are always we're always presuming the defense to something, right? Um, and to go back to uh, the, the uh, trans point, these uh, fault lines that I talked about on the last slide, even within the gay, uh, within like the gay world are sometimes very, very uh, 
tough line to get through. If we were to sort of follow the binary backwards, you know, we would say there are boys and girls and you can, and you're, you know, supposed to be a boy who likes girls and a girl who likes boys. But then if we go into an um, LGBTQ plus uh, centric framework, the reason that a lot of transphobia ends up happening in gay spaces is that we sort of do this thing where we say, well, you can be a boy who likes boys and that means you're gay, so you can be gay, but something about your masculinity is still intact because you're still a boy, right? So this undercurrent of the binary is still intact because maybe I'm a boy who likes boys and maybe these people over here are a boy who likes girls and a girl who likes boys, right? Um, so there's, um, you know, being straight and being gay here, right? But under a stereotypically masculine framework of being gay, we're both still boys, right? And that sort of changes when you talk to different gay people, right? But then all of a sudden you have a boy who says, well, I'm not a boy, I'm a girl, and my name is this, and my pronouns are this, right? And all of a sudden some of us lose our minds, right? Um, because there's still this deeply seated need for the binary to function the way that it does. Even though as gay people, we know that the binary doesn't help us in the way that we think it does. But then, you know, this cisgender uh, privilege applies to gay people as well. And so we will say, whoa, whoa, whoa. You can be a boy who likes boys and that's gay and that's cool. Yay for you. That's great. M you know me too, <laughs> but all, all of a sudden you're bringing this other aspect of gender into it. And suddenly being trans is something that complicates that function. And therefore it complicates the toxicity that's supposed to function in a certain way, right? And that's why a lot of people are surprised when I tell them that uh, transphobia um, is something that still happens in LGBTQ plus spaces. Um, and that, the same as the example before, is not something that accidentally happens. It, it serves a particular power structure that means that you can't bring your whole self to the table. It means that I'm not going to trust you to tell me who you are, right? Um, and, and I firmly believe that people have a right to narrate their own selves, to narrate you know, how they see the world. And even gay men get really uncomfortable by the fact that, you know, somebody comes out as trans and there's, and what unfortunately sometimes happens is that there's this deeply seated structure about, as I said, well, you know, you can be a boy who likes girls and a girl who likes boys, and you can even be a boy who likes boys. But whatever we agree on about being a boy, right, about being a man in the world, still must be intact. But that's not true if you come out as trans, right? And somehow you've flipped your sociosexual script. Um, well, not the sociosexual script, that's a different term, but you have somehow flipped my perception of your gender, right? And that's why you get gay men who are really transphobic. <laughs> um, and that sort of goes back to the first slide about the way that these things compound each other and the way that they don't function in a vacuum, right? Um, so there's that. Um, a call to action. So if we know that toxicity allows us um, or toxicity uh, means that we can't show up as our whole selves, well, why do we, why, why does it bode well for us to do away with that? And why does it bode well for us to talk about these things? Um, and this is a quote from the same, from the same person on the last slide. Um, she says, what makes for a livable world is no idle question. It is not merely a question for philosophers. Um, and I'll just go ahead and condense what she says here. Um, it bodes well for us 
to ask these kinds of questions about the stereotypes that we hold and the way that they function, because it means that we can be a part of creating a world where we can show up to the table with our whole selves, um, where we are able to do those things and all of the um, multitudes of being a person, right, are allowed without that meaning that I'm not tough enough or I'm not man enough to do something, right? Um, so a lot of times I run into people who say, well, that's just the way things are. This is, you know, being straight or, you know, being a boy or a girl in the world, like that's just how these things are, right? And they never want to challenge those things, right? And that means that the toxicity gets to stay where it is. And where it is, is in a place socially for it to still do what it's supposed to do, right? What it's meant to do, even though toxicity will function toxically if we don't do anything about it. Um, and so if you're able to show up at the table with your whole self, then masculinity is no longer toxic. Masculinity in the specific way that we're talking about it here no longer has the power to be toxic because it doesn't cut you off before you've come to the table, before you add something to the table, right? And then we don't have this reality where you can't cry or you can't be gay or you can't talk about how you feel as a man um, and all those other like toxic things that have come to um, attach themselves or I'm sorry, the, the, the way that the things we attach to masculinity often become toxic because of the way that we keep them really tightly closed off, right? So um, this call to, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the, the reason that I titled this slide the way that I did is because it's what I would like the takeaway to be, um, that it bodes well for us to talk about these things so that the toxicity is no longer there and so that we construct a world where we can show up at the table with our whole selves, even and specifically in you know the gay world, um, because that toxicity bleeds over into our spaces as well, even though we're gay. So that toxicity is not something that only exists for straight people and uh, is not only coded for with a straight sense of masculinity, it also affects, you know, um, the way that non-straight people see the world and see themselves and contributes actively to violence against people in our own circles. Um, so that's not to go without saying too. Um, I'm gonna go, okay, I was gonna say, I think my next slide is discussion. Um, so I will open up the floor for questions or questions, comments, thoughts. Um, oh, one second. I just wanted to notify everyone that I am going to stop the recording now.